Good evening, everyone. I'm Betty Ann Hedges, the Executive Director of Humanist Canada. Tonight, we are sharing our platform with the British Columbia Humanist Association and the Centre for Inquiry Canada for this live roundtable discussion on the cost of religion in Canada. We are recording today on March 19th, 2024. And as always, this recording will be available after this event on all of our various platforms. Let me introduce our speakers. Ian Bushfield. Ian is the Executive Director of the British Columbia Humanist Association. And there in the same part of our world as Ian is Teal Phelps Bondaroff, the Research Coordinator at BCHA. And with us representing the Center for Inquiry Canada is Leslie Rosenblood. Leslie is a member of CFIC and hosts their podcast for Inquiry. And we are launching our poll tonight that came out to you uh, this morning, so you could give it some thought. Um, please look for its center screen and we will share the results later in our session. We will take questions at the end by hand or by chat. Leslie will start us off. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining. It's wonderful to see so many people here tonight. And I wanted to tell you why we, we undertook this research. So this is what, I, what I'm going to be sharing with you today is based on original research done by for the Center for Inquiry Canada. And there's lots of talk about the social costs of religion. And there's lots of examples of that, that uh, religion enhances in-group amity, but it also enhances out-group enmity. Uh, people can believe that prayers are a substitute for action. Thoughts and prayers, anyone? Uh, people with a religious bent may perpetrate crimes against children and then spend decades covering up those crimes against children, taking strong stands against reproductive rights for women, opposing equal rights for the LGBT community, and much, much more. We're not going to talk about any of those things today. Today, we're going to talk about money, cold, hard cash, and quantify the costs of religion. In, uh, in the cost of religion in Canada with specific dollars amounts based on rigorous research conducted by CFIC. So I want to start with the headline figure. Just a few policy choices by various levels of government has resulted in direct and indirect subsidies of over five and a half billion dollars. That's billion with a B each and every year. And we're going to spend the rest of our time this evening going through how we came up with that number. So, uh, but yeah, I think that's a good place to pause and and just set the um, uh, set the stage for tonight's conversation. So, uh, Betty Ann has started the poll, and we just want to test your knowledge about a few things, and we want to see if. Uh, uh, you're going to learn something tonight. So let, let's see how much everyone knows as we start the conversation, and then we can compare that with uh, what we're going to be sharing with you this evening. I think maybe that's a good point with that poll question to go into the clergy residence deduction, which is actually where uh, the BC Humanist Association has contributed to this broader project and question, which CFIC has done some fantastic work summarizing and doing the top, kind of top level. And we looked at a couple specific examples. The clergy residence deduction is one of these things that kind of always bothered me because when I do my income taxes, I go through and there's just like, you'll sometimes see it, it's buried in there among the, you know, check all of these different forms off and you can get all these deductions. Maybe you were a volunteer firefighter, maybe you had post-secondary education credits, those kind of things, charitable donations, things we're all used to. Buried in there is the clergy residence deduction and this is a write-off for members of the clergy uh, and other religious ministers to deduct their housing expenses from their income taxes. This, we looked into the records, was date uh, introduced in the 1950s, actually, by or uh, late 1940s, by MPs who thought that there should be exemptions for the good work that the clergy do uh, MP Gordon Graydon said, we would not have a nation worth the name if we did not have our churches. Uh, other MPs questioned whether this was a valuable use of tax dollars, but they still said that churches were fantastic. It's just 
you know, if we start exempting clergy residences, what are we going to do next? Uh, let people deduct their union fees and professional fees, which ended up happening. So uh, unfortunate for that guy, the tax code became quite complex. The policy changed over the years. In the 1950s, we added a functions test because it seemed like it was starting to balloon as teachers at religious colleges started to apply for it, and they narrowed that down. And then more recently, they've updated the language a little bit, so it's not just available to clergy men, but all clergy and all religious professionals. Using the federal uh, estimates, we found that this does cost $100 million a year to the federal treasury. It was about $95 million officially in 2017, which was the last year uh, we had numbers for, and was estimated to go over $100 million in the following years. There's about 27,000 clergy who get this deduction. It lets them deduct $394 million off of taxable income. And that works out to $14,000 in savings per clergy member. Uh, we did in our report some analysis that shows how much you could save if you were a clergy member. And it's about a third of your income taxes for the average clergy person. So that's not a small amount. It's, it's a very interesting one and it hasn't been tested a lot and you know the big thing that we question with this and I think that Leslie will get into and Teal will get into is the opportunity cost of all of this by subsidizing religion in all of these ways we are not necessarily able to fund other social programs or reduce your taxes depending on your economic outlook in this uh, this requires all of us to bear the burden uh, in when they were introducing the clergy residence deduction one of the MPs actually said, I don't think anyone would care about carrying this extra burden to help our clergy members. And I think the people on this call would disagree. So I'll turn it back to Leslie to go a little bit more into some of the other numbers. All right. So there's another uh, interesting exemption given to uh, religious institutions. And, uh, uh, and that is what's, uh, what's known as the property tax exemption. So if you own a condominium or, your, or a house, uh, you know that uh, wherever it is that you happen to live, you have to pay property taxes. But if if your building or if the land is owned or, or has on it a house of worship, so it's no longer just a church, but a house of worship, then you are exempt from property taxes uh, across Canada, all 10 provinces and all three territories. Now, as I said uh, before, we wanted to be specific. We wanted to, to quantify uh, the costs of religion and not just give a list of exemptions. This is the exemption that was hardest to quantify because there's a lot of complexity involved with that. First of all, every municipality has their own tax rate. So if we wanted to get right down and get very specific, we would have to go into every municipality in, in Canada and calculate the, uh, the value of that, uh, of that exemption and then sum it up across, uh, across for the nation. But there's a second uh, complexity involved with that, and that is uh, religious organizations, when they submit their, uh, when they submit their taxes, I'm going to get into this a little bit more later on, they give the purchase value of the land, not the market value of the land. So the numbers that we have are different than the numbers that are used when calculating the property taxes. And the, the, the current market value of the land that houses of worship were on is simply not available in a, in a public way systematically across Canada. But there is something that we did find. And that is the province of New Brunswick, as part of a wide ranging study to look at ways that they could essentially save uh, some money, uh, took uh, uh, examined examined its expenditures and the costs of the various tax credits that uh, that it had, and within that, they they published the uh, the cost of the property tax exemption to the coffers of the province. So we were able to take that. Um, and uh, we were able to determine that uh, based on the stated value of the, uh, of the, sorry, the purchase value of the land that houses of worship have and the lost revenue, we, we were able to say that we were able to determine that it's about 3.3% of the, of the purchase value of the land is the cost of uh, the annual cost of lost revenue to the provinces. So we extrapolated that 
across Canada, we, we did have the purchase value of the land for all of the houses of worship in, in Canada. We were able to uh, get that sum, apply a value of 3.3% to that, and then we come to 900, uh, just under $900 million, $881 million is, uh, is basically being taken away from uh, municipal uh, treasuries across Canada every year because the governments of Canada have decided that uh, houses of worship don't need to pay property taxes, despite the uh, mm -hmm. fact that uh, churches, temples, mosques, and so on are often on prime real estate in the center in the center of the city. I might jump in here, Leslie, if I may, because we, we've also done similar research on this and we've kind of taken a slightly more um, narrow uh, focus with some of the just the BC approach. Uh, so just building what Leslie was saying, different provinces have different ways of adjudicating tax exemptions as they relate to uh, places of worship. Um, Ian and I have mostly focused on BC for this area, so we we're very grateful for some of the national work. One of the things that we did was we looked at the distinction between permissive and statutory tax exemptions. So those of you whose eyes are about to glaze over, um, I'll try to make this as, as exciting a description as possible. But basically, there's different types of tax exemptions. So we've heard of the clergy residency exemption, and then there's a sort of general tax exemption for places of worship, but you can break it down here in British Columbia, and it may be different in different jurisdictions. So please check your local province and municipality. But it's broken down here in statutory and permissive tax exemptions. Our statutory ones are the ones that are automatically applied by the province. If you are a place of worship, you automatically get this. And the permissive ones, and when it's in the name, are, are permissible. The municipality can grant them if they want to. Um, and what we found when we did an analysis of every municipality in British Columbia was that there's considerable diversity in those. So just to explain the, um, the different types of tax exemptions, because Leslie was doing a really good job talking about like, the overall property value. What we have in British Columbia here is if you have a place of worship, the building itself is statutorily, the place where the worship takes place is statutorily exempt. So if you can imagine my square here as a um, uh, as a property, and then this little square right here is the actual place of worship, this part of the land is exempt. But the rest of the land may or may not be exempt, and it could apply for a statutory exemption. So the property value of the building is exempt, and that can be, as we've just heard, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the land around it can be included in that. Um, and what we found was that there was considerable diversity of approaches that municipalities had. Some automatically granted it, like, congratulations, your entire land is tax exempt without any kind of oversight. Some would have uh, some mechanisms like you had to apply or maybe not. And then some of them would have what we call the benefits test, which would be like, hey, we're giving you a tax exemption. The purpose of this tax exemption is, as my colleagues have already mentioned, to support work that benefits the community. If that's the case, maybe you should demonstrate that you have a community benefit rather than assuming it. Um, and by contrast, if you look at how the tax exemptions work here in British Columbia, if you have like a boys and girls club or a children's rowing society or a group that's dedicated to feeding people experiencing homelessness, those groups tend to have to apply for their tax exemption every 10 years or often more often than that. Whereas once a place of worship is granted a tax exempt status, it is in perpetuity unless the building changes hands. So even if it changes between different sects of a religion, one that's open to the public, one that's not, that doesn't matter, it's automatically exempt. Whereas if my rowing club went from rowing to kayaking, we would have to reapply and we'd have to reapply every few years as well. And what we did here was sort of, um, I think really a good sort of parallel project to what um, TFI was doing, which was we went through the, so for the permissive tax exemptions, because they are granted by municipalities, they have to report on that. So we went through the month, the annual reports of every single municipality in British Columbia and extracted the reported value for their permissive tax exemptions and came up with a number which is a bit lower, but it's sort of the, the ones that are reported on by municipalities. And this is from 2019. And what we found was 12.5 million in permissive tax exemptions across British Columbia. Um, and then when you looked at statutory tax exemptions, it was 45.9 million. The challenge you ran into is similar to what Leslie was describing, which was we don't have a baseline. So you have a place of worship and you do you compare it to uh, another not-for-profit use? Do you compare it to if it was housing? Do you compare it to if it was industrial use, light industrial use, maximal possible use? And so the challenge you get in there now is that a lot of these tax exemptions for places of worship, when we're trying to do the math, are already very low for other reasons. And then they're already being granted automatically. So there's some some challenges there. Um, I have a lot more to talk about on this topic as well, but I think I might get to go pass along to our, our wonderful moderator to maybe direct us with some questions. But just for folks who are following along, what we've kind of seen is 
a wide range of different ways in which religious organizations, institutions, and places of worship can receive tax exempt status. And one of the things that I found most frustrating, and I'm now finding more frustrating, I'm now a city council in the district of Saanich, so I find it even more frustrating, is these things are automatic. So it's not like a municipal government or a local or a provincial government can decide if they want to grant that tax exempt status. It's automatically granted. And that takes away a considerable amount of autonomy that municipal, uh, municipal governments would normally have. And a lot of these tax exemptions, as uh, my friends have already mentioned, they were put in place to help support groups that provide a benefit to the community. And of course, there's a tacit assumption that places of worship and religious institutions do <laughs> provide a benefit to the community. But that's something that we would like to see demonstrated and we would probably challenge in some cases because what we found in some of our research, and I can point to examples in a bit, was that sometimes they're not. And in fact, their actions are actually providing adverse impacts. Um, and so municipalities can't even decide how to best spend their tax exempt status. Um, they're just giving away money um, automatically and sometimes uh, quite easily without a lot of oversight. And that becomes problematic when you have challenging perspectives that say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be investing in a group that discriminates against people, is running commercial operations, is a private members club, or has a host of other challenges. But Leslie, we haven't talked about the big number yet that you calculated oh, I know. the charities. Oh, in that up. case, well, in that case, I, I kind of jumped a shark there. So Leslie, right. why don't you tell us, let's go a step even further, please. <laughs> all, all right. So uh, there's a lot there that I'll, uh, that, that, that I'd love to build on, on Teal, but uh, uh, the the big numbers. So what we've talked about are are two policies so far. Uh, we've we've talked about the clergy residence ex exemption and the property uh, municipal property tax exemption. So those are two distinct policies, both from the federal level, uh, one at the federal level, one on the provincial or territorial level. Uh, but there's one other policy that Canada has, and this one is huge, and there are multiple facets to it. So I'm going to take it at different uh, different aspects. But uh, this the, the one policy is. What is a charity? And according to the Canada Revenue Agency, there are if you're going to be a charity, you have to achieve one of four goals and you have to declare one of them. So uh, what they are are uh, the relief of poverty, the advancement of education, other purposes beneficial to the community, or advancement of religion. And so... There is this presumption that Teal said that uh, there an advancement of religion is beneficial to society, and this, while you may question that, um, is something that uh, is actually a fairly widely held belief. Because uh, as part of another uh, organization that I'm a part of, the Canada Canadian Secular Alliance, we got a letter from then Finance Minister Jim Flaherty. And uh, uh, this is about uh, about a decade ago, and he wrote that uh, that uh, advancement of religion is uh, based on the presumption that uh, it provides a moral and, and ethical foundation and is beneficial to society. And I mean, I'll leave it to you to make up your own mind, but I, for one, would challenge that presumption. But I promise to talk to you about about cold hard numbers. So I'm going to do that. Uh, so what the, what the Center for Inquiry did was uh, we filed a freedom of information request and we got a list of all of the charities that declared that their primary purpose was to advance religion. And then of that, we took the subset of those of those charitable institutions. And according to their own self-declared activities, we filtered out so that we looked at those that did nothing but advance religion. So these were not churches or gurdwaras that have a food uh, that have a food bank or a soup kitchen. These are not uh, um, houses of worship that provide English as a second language classes for refugees. These are these are organizations that, according to their own filings, do nothing but advance religion. They proselytize, they evangelize, like they prepare the roof on their on their church. Whatever it is they do, they are simply advancing religion. And why is this a big deal? Well, that's an excellent question. The biggest benefit to being a registered charity is the ability to issue tax receipts. So if you donate $100 to a nonprofit organization, well, you may get the warm and fuzzy feelings inside, but at the end of the day, there's $100 left. Uh, that's that your your bank account is debited by a hundred dollars, 
But if you donate that $100 to a charity, then you get a tax receipt. And when, you, and when it's tax time, you get part of that back depending on, um, depending on your income. So if you make say 30 or $40,000 a year, you donate $100 and you might get 30 or $40 back at tax time. If you make $30 million a year, you donate $100, you'll probably get 50, $55 back. So the more money you make, the more the, the government uh, tax credit is. Well, Canadians are uh, a generous bunch. So uh, they donated over $18 billion to charities of all stripes in 2018. And almost 7.5 billion of that, or over 40% of the total, were to religious charities. And by my definition here, when I say religious charities, I mean those charities whose primary purpose is to advance religion and according to their filings with Canada Revenue Agency, did nothing but advance religion. So uh, uh, we were able to calculate using very conservative assumptions that Canadians enjoyed $3.2 billion in tax relief for in 2018 alone by donations to religious charities. And based on those very conservative assumptions that we made, in principle, the actual number could be lower. In reality, the true subsidy for evangelism and proselytizing is much, much higher than that. But wait, there's more. <laughs> so should I proceed or do we want to talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more? Were there, there some questions, questions there, Betty Ann? Did you want to bring out for us? Yeah, I've got some questions in the chat um, from Paul Sparks. Do all charitable organizations receive an exemption for property tax? No. So the uh, the property tax exemption is not related to being a charity. That is something that is uh, specific to being a house of worship. But in I should note that some charitable organizations that have property can apply for a tax exemption through sometimes similar or adjacent mechanisms. So in some jurisdictions, your local children's boat club can also apply for a tax exempt status for their building. Sometimes it's not allocated in an in equitable way. But um, yeah, you, you tend to be a difference between uh, some some not for profits don't own property. Um, and so it would be a different category based on your ownership of property. Uh, from Jill, does this tax exemption apply to home churches that are common among the evangelical sects? If that's recognized as a house of worship by the government, then yes. If it's like an underground and it's just happened, if it's a personal home, if the primary purpose of the building is as a personal residence that also hosts Sunday services, then no. It depends on how, basically, it depends on how um, it's classified uh, by the government. What yeah, about here, private island, uh, what about private islands, Ian? Yeah, there was a good case here in British Columbia recently where someone's island just off of the uh, Swartz Bay Ferry Terminal worth $13 million. They wanted to set up a Shinto shrine, shrine there, uh, but they also had a like vacation home that it clearly looked like a vacation home from the water. And there's two tests that you legally have to pass to be a place of worship for property tax purposes in BC. One is the uh, invitation test. So it's not just that you have to be a place of worship, you have to be a place of public worship. So you have to be obviously inviting people from the public without discrimination to your uh, church or island or wherever you're doing your worship. And then the principal use test says that it has to be primarily for uh, worship. And that's why your basement church wouldn't apply because even if you invite all of the public to your basement church, 80% of the time you're still using it as your house. So it wouldn't be a place of public worship for that purpose. Each province will treat these a little bit differently and that's what makes the property tax thing particularly confusing. I noticed we had some questions about strategy and, and advocacy. I think I'll maybe put a pin in those for later on. Sorry, uh, Beth, go ahead. No, I just want to say, Ian, is that why you see churches not often used for other reasons, even if it could be a source of income for them or to the benefit of the community? That's a good question. I know in BC, they have to be a place of worship for, I believe it's, I wanted to say 150 days a year, but that seems high. Um, it does have to be a principal use as a place of worship. Um they can't sell alcohol in BC. Mm. It has like one weird specific rule on them. Uh, and they do, 
uh, yeah, mm. it, it, they can't, it doesn't want them to be used as a commercial venue, basically, because otherwise, right. you'd move a little bit away from that. Right, and this right. can become this is fuzzy often when it comes to bookings. So like, a lot of times places of worship will be completely empty and unutilized for large periods of time, as opposed to like weekend worship or whenever their religious day happens to be. Some places will rent the spaces out. And then as Ian was intimating, there is a difference between like renting out at cost or at recovery for asset depreciation and staff time and making a profit off of it. And one of the things that we found with our permissive tax exempt status was a lot of places may have actually been operating commercial operations and making a profit. There was a, a First Baptist Church in downtown Victoria that was successfully operating a uh, parking structure and making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in revenue. And when they were challenged on this, they said, well, of course, we need to make the revenue so we can pay for our security guy and our, our team to maintain the parking garage. And the response is like, yeah, but that's still a commercial operation. <laughs> You're running a business. And so sometimes there's a very fuzzy uh, area between what constitutes a commercial operation and what constitutes like legitimately allowing your space to be rented by community groups. Not to mention what Leslie was already mentioning, which is sometimes these organizations will only rent to certain types of community groups. So if the local Satanist club wants to get together and have a coloring book fun with Satan, um, they may prohibit people from renting that space as opposed to some groups might be you know, welcome, more welcome than others, as it were. And that's another level of potential discrimination, which can often be uh, parsed out in a little more detail. Right, right. Ellen, how, Ellen's getting creative here. If humanist organizations were recognized and then granted charitable status, would they be exempt from property taxes? There's layers to that one. This well, is a great question. Do you want to take it, Leslie? Well, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll do the, I'll do the first the first pass, and 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 that is. Uh, even if humanist organizations that are currently nonprofits were to be recognized as charitable institutions, uh, because their social centers, like their uh, community centers, are not uh, houses of worship, they would get the benefits of being a charity, but they would not get the property tax exemption. Now, now that so that's that's very specific. I think, although I, I want to be fair, and you probably are asking a more a, more, a broader philosophical question, and uh, and that is, what if we granted charitable status to everybody? And so we're not just we're not just uh, 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 favoring religion. And a, a strict reading of uh, secularist principles, which is that uh, you should neither uh, 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 you should neither support nor suppress religious expression. You treat every you don't discriminate one way or the other. Uh, giving charitable status to everybody would meet that uh, would meet that condition. But that kind of dilutes, in my opinion, the definition of charity. If anybody doing anything can be a charity, then charity kind of loses its uh, uh, its meaning. And I really want to keep the meaning of charity to be you are doing things that are beneficial to the community. And I fully support freedom of religion. I think everyone is entitled to whatever faith it is that they that they believe in or want to believe in. And I also, with equal fervor, believe in freedom from religion. Uh, because I do not want to be subject to the taboos and the restrictions um, or uh, that of of your belief system. Essentially, if uh, if you're on a diet, that doesn't mean I can't eat a donut. So I I would like uh, so I would prefer that if you want to advance religion, by all means, go ahead. But you shouldn't be getting government subsidies to do so, and get being recognized as a charitable a charitable organization is. A government subsidy. You, notably, you I was going to say, donut. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, notably, Center for Inquiry Canada, Humanist Canada, and BC Humanist Association are all registered charities. But none of us are registered to advance religion. Uh, our purposes are educational and or advancing human rights generally. Uh, at least for my purpose, I believe that's the same for yeah. both of you. Center for Inquiry is a national educational charity. Yeah, and one of the challenges with the religion uh, approach in Canada is our case law and our um, bureaucrats view religion as requiring an element of theistic worship. That's official CRA policy, and that's in the policy of the BC assessment that does places of worship here. Uh, it's in an obscure section of the tax code we probably won't talk about that I discovered today that deals with uh, income taxes for Hutterites, where they have to have an element of theistic worship or belief in a supreme being. And this theistic requirement for religion 
is an extra layer of discrimination where even if you said, you know what, advancing conscience and religion, which is what the charter says in 2A, is the freedom of conscience and religion should be charitable and should be viewed as beneficial. We are only promoting theistic beliefs. Uh, the UK, for example, England and Wales has changed its charitable law and actually has a charity law, I should say, to recognize that advancement of religion can involve belief in one or more gods or belief in no gods. So atheist charities like Humanist UK can be a registered religious charity. Uh, that Teal put a link to a Church of Atheism case in Canada where one guy in central Ontario started a church of atheism and tried to get charitable status. And uh, he didn't get a lawyer. And my first advice is to always get a lawyer if you're going to go to court and start a constitutional challenge. Uh, and he lost his case because they said, you don't believe in God. And he said, well, there's Buddhists who don't believe in God who have charitable status. And the court went, well, too bad. And that's why you need a lawyer. But if this is you call us like we have people on standby because there was a lot of potential. And as Ian points out, like it's actually overtly discriminatory to non-theistic religions. But like, yeah, this person clearly was trying, but they didn't quite have the legal structure. If this is you or this is you in the future, please get in touch. But uh, yeah, there was a question about um, summer camps. And I was wondering, I know, Ian, you, you're a bit more versed on this when we were exploring some of our work around summer camps. I was wondering if I might pitch that one to you. Because um, there are other categories, like when you're looking at the tax code, there's the places of worship, but there's also religious summer camps. And we had a scandal out here recently on the West Coast where a, or somewhere in British Columbia, rather, where you had uh, a religious camp that was not hiring LGBTQ plus staff people. And they were still applying and received, after some kerfuffle, uh, a tax exempt status in the local municipality. And this was, of course, controversial because, in a sense, you have a government agency who is beholden, a government entity who is beholden to the charter, uh, directly subsidizing a group that is violating said charter. And that becomes problematic. You know, I don't know if you want to add anything else on summer camps. Yeah, I know there was a case in BC law a number of years ago where a Young Life Christian camp tried to get the place of public worship exemption for their property. And that one actually set a lot of the nuance around what is a place of public worship and what isn't. And they kind of decided that that didn't meet the principal use tests I met because uh, mentioned because it was more about doing the summer camp with worship than that. Uh, and they tried, I think they ultimately went a different way. And like you mentioned, there are other categories of property tax exemptions, but not, not many are as automatic as place of public worship. Uh, there are a couple, I think, like cemeteries and uh, government buildings are often exempt from taxes, but it varies by province as well. But I know we have lots more to discuss. So Doug Thomas is asking, interestingly enough, this is interesting, the Cambridge Ontario Scientology Centre was denied property tax exemption because they did not offer wedding services. Unmask myself. Um, I would just... That's a bandwidth thing. It's not a privacy thing. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of an unusual local decision. The regional uh, or the Cambridge City Council said you 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 can't have tax exemption because you don't offer wedding services. Now that may have changed. They may offer those now, but it was kind of a strange. Well, I thought a rather strange qualifier. Um, I'm not sure. Well, I guess. Technically speaking, Scientology is a religion, but it was, it's a big, by the way, it's a big center. It would be a major tax, piece of tax revenue. So I, I thought it would be an interesting opportunity for us to uh, open a humanist center of some kind, which we're not about to do, uh, and offer weddings, which of course we do because we have um, humanist officiants in our area. Um, that is very strange. Um, by the way, SCS has constantly said that that charitable status bias is unfair. And we've talked to the CRA about that. Um, in fact, when we formed our, our group uh, now 13 years ago, um, we actually applied for charitable status mostly to test the water. And we gave them three goals. One was to act as a nexus for secular humanists in Canada. The other was to lobby the government to change legislation, this kind of legislation we're talking about tonight. And the third one was to represent Canadian humanism internationally as a voting member of Humanist International, for example. And they came back and said, okay, on the nexus part, 
no, you can't have charitable status if you're going to lobby the government. You can't do that. That was pretty obvious to us anyway. But the one that really raised their eyebrows, and I've got lots of room to do that, uh, was that they said you cannot be a charitable entity in Canada and have voting representatives on an international body. And we immediately, and it was a six-page report, by the way, explaining that. So we responded and said, well, okay, how then does the Roman Catholic Church get to send bishops or cardinals to Rome to vote for the Pope? Or how does the uh, Anglican Church of Canada get to go to the Church of England Synod and vote if they've got charitable status as because of religions? Shortly thereafter, by the way, the, the Humanist Canada became a voting member of Humanist International, which they hadn't been able to do before. So we have always wondered, is that did we have some influence on that? Of course, we can't claim it, but it, it just it's it's a judgment call on the part of the CRA, and they base everything on on um, court decisions from the past. So if you want to change that, we almost have to go to court uh, to the Supreme Court of Canada and get them to rule um, to change it. Uh, getting the government to change it doesn't seem to have any uh, traction. You're kind of getting into what I was going to talk about, Doug, which was yeah. some of the challenges around advocacy and, and changing legislation. I might be uh, getting ahead of ourselves here. One thing I wanted to build on what Doug was saying, though, was we don't really have a functional definition of what constitutes a religion in Canada. Uh, Ian and I have hit this with our work time and time again. If you dig into the CRA records, you have this kind of fuzzy definition around like theistic worship, but that obviously doesn't work. It obviously excludes some faith traditions that don't meet those criteria that are obviously religions and we don't really have a, a set definition and the government seems quite happy to operate in that space one thing it's worth noting though the government and cra aren't as excited about granting tax exempt status and treating as religion satirical religions whereas in the united states groups like you know the secular satanists and fly, the church of the flying spaghetti noodle monster they will have like legal standing in the context of they can be recognized as faith traditions in canada that's not really uh, a thing. Uh, it's harder to make the case for satirical religions. I know Ian has more experience with this. Uh, we've chatted about this in the past. But yeah, if you want to register your own religion, it becomes more challenging. And so often there's other mechanisms that people can pull as opposed to trying to opposing the 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 policy rather than playing the game in a sort of a more satirical kind of challenging way. It's not even yeah, just yeah. that Canada doesn't define religion in law. It's no. that we don't define charity in law. What a charity is in Canada is based on the Magna Carta. Uh, it's formally based on the four categories Leslie mentioned that were written in the Pemsel case of the House of Lords in the late 19th century. And mm -hmm. it pulled those from like the introduction of the Elizabethan statutes in the 1700s. This is why this all feels so antiquated, mm -hmm. because it is. We're the only Commonwealth country that doesn't have a Charities Act. Yeah. We're the only Commonwealth yeah. country that has not defined this in law. And that's why we're still relying on these absurd uh, historical precedents. And, you know, the only place that religion is really mentioned in our constitutions, not in the Constitution Act of 1867 uh, or any other uh, just religion, it's just not there. Uh, it's assumed to be the default position in 1867 all the way through now. The only place that's really mentioned specifically is Section 2 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it says that one of the fundamental rights is the right to freedom of conscience and religion which the Supreme Court of Canada in 1984 interpreted to include freedom from religion as well as freedom of religion. Um, but that's the, only, that's the only thing. And there had been some uh, opinion lately, legal opinion lately, that it really only applies directly to government. So if I go to the local mall, as I've done, and object to them having Christmas music but then denying us the right to have a free space, which they used to offer to charities, uh, and say that's discrimination. Basically, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms does not really protect that with, for me. It's mostly a focus, according to this uh, recent opinion, it's really only if a government discriminates against you. That's not recent opinion. The human rights uh, yeah. code of your province would protect you from discrimination by a private entity. Yeah, that's how that's, it's been it since would. the charter was brought in. Yeah, that's, not that's right. That's but let's get, I think, let's get back to the numbers. Yeah. Sure. Uh, All right. So uh, 
there's there there is there is more. I I did promise you that there was more, but I gave you I gave you the big number. So three point two billion at, at a minimum, and and probably significantly more than that, uh, because these institutions again by their own self declared um, activities do nothing but advance religion. They uh, people get three point two billion dollars in tax credits uh, as a result of. Um, uh, being able to, uh, as, as a result of being recognized as as a charity, so there's also something that, for reasons that make sense only to a particular kind of government bureaucrat, there's something called the public service body rebate. And what that is essentially is that if you are a charity, you have and that you 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 buy things, right, and you have to pay GST or HST depending on your province or territory on the things that you buy. If you are a charity, you get about half of that HST or GST back from the federal government when you file uh, your annual your annual taxes, and that's called a public service body rebate, open to all charities in Canada, including those that do nothing that but evangelize, and that uh, that subsidy is worth three hundred and eighteen million dollars per year for religious charities alone in Canada. So for being for getting the public service body rebate, and there's more. So I'm going. So governments, for various reasons, just give money. So not tax credits, not refunds, not rebates. You can pay pay less than you would otherwise. They just give money to various charities, and uh, the federal government does it, and they do it at, at least in 2018. Uh, to the tune of uh, $140 million. Provincial governments do it, and summing across the, pro the provinces and territories, three quarters of a billion dollars just in 2018. And so do municipal governments, again, to the tune of $217 million. So I think you may be wondering who's getting these funds, right? That's an entirely fair question. So there were 2,536 religious charities that got uh, direct cash transfers from one of the from at least one of the three levels of government. And I don't have the time to enumerate all of them. But what I will do is I'll tell you about the largest federal grant in 2018. It was twenty million one hundred ninety eight thousand three hundred and $83 to be exact, and it was to the Kelowna Christian Center Society. This is a recurring and consistently growing subsidy. It started with $13.7 million in 2013, and it grew to over $22 million in 2019. So you're probably wondering, what do they do? Well, uh, they offer programs such as weekly church services, Christian education, K through 12, through a campus school and online, Christian preschool, Christian outreach, local, provincial, national, and international pastoral care programs for the development of families from children through senior adults and Christian daycare. There, the Kelowna Christian Center's uh, tagline is where people belong and Jesus matters. And their vision is to raise up and influence the world around us by creating a space to know God find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference through Bible-based and Jesus-centered living. So that's where the federal, that's the largest single donation uh, or transfer, excuse me, from the federal government. But I'll, as large as that is, over $20 million, it's dwarfed by what, uh, by what Ontario and Saskatchewan give to Christian Horizons. Now, you may be wondering, how much does Christian Horizons receive? It's a staggering $163.4 million in 2018 alone. And I'm going to tell you who they are. And so that you don't think that I'm summarizing or paraphrasing or uh, representing them unfairly or inaccurately, I'm going to quote them directly. So Christian Horizons is, and this is a direct quotation, a Christian organization to support families who experience developmental disabilities with an ongoing commitment to innovative faith-based service options. Their mission, 
as an expression of Christian faith, we work together with people who experience disabilities to accomplish their goals and nurture communities where everybody belongs. Their vision, people who experience disabilities belong to communities in which their God-given gifts are valued and respected, their values. Christians, Christian horizons, values arise from our belief that every person is loved by God and created in his image. Because of this, we strive to honor God and value people in all we do and with all our resources. So those are the facts. I'll leave it to you to decide whether these organizations should receive direct transfers from our governments. So I think that's a lot of information all at once. And uh, I think I'll pause here if uh, Ian or, or Teal want to, to jump in with some insight or analysis. I mostly wanted to jump in with sort of the next steps because I always feel when I see these numbers, I, I, and I know some of you, and I see um, Esmail has a question as well. So I want to go to uh, their question. But uh, I, I always find that these numbers are big. Uh, and when we break them down to smaller chunks, we can find examples of, ooh, that's interesting. Maybe we can do some advocacy there. So I was really keen to talk about like next steps and how we can really try to change these things. Because otherwise I find I get very frustrated when I see these huge numbers, like we could be spending on literally anything. Um, so I might just pitch to Ian if he has any thoughts before we, we dive in. I mean, I just wanted to emphasize some of the numbers we've missed so far, because there's a lot more out there. Like mm -hmm. even just here in BC, we know that three provinces in this country fully fund separate Catholic school systems, Ontario, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Uh, Ontario, it's somewhere between nine and $10 billion goes to fund that school system. Alberta's about 1.3 billion, Saskatchewan about $600 million to those systems. Now, you can't just eliminate that funding and be like, wow, we've cut funding to religion because you'd leave a lot of students without schools. But there's definitely efficiencies to be made when you are running two schools side by side in every district in those three provinces and funding them both and having administrators in both. It's a lot of overhead that could be cut and a lot of busing yeah. that could there be was, There was a study done if they yeah. uh, if we close zero schools but but uh, merge the, the, the public and separate school systems, it would save $1.5 billion every year in Ontario. So yeah, nine or $10 billion spent on the system, save 1.5 annually by merging them. I also uh, wanted to highlight something that like just building on Leslie's comment uh, was that a lot of the work that that he's been working on is focused on like the very narrow definition of what constitutes a religious charity. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that are very adjacent. When you were talking about some of the ones in uh, in the interior here in British Columbia, I was just recalling, I saw Joyce on the call here. Um, I've been working with the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada research team, and we've been looking at crisis pregnancy centers, right? So those wouldn't register in the criteria that CFI has been using because they are there to provide care for people experiencing unplanned pregnancies. What's, what's wrong with that, right? But when you peek into the uh when you lift the curtain if as you were on those you find out that they're deeply religious organizations that are deeply anti-choice that are manipulating people through deception and misinformation to try to convince them not to have an abortion and they're doing so in the name of their religion so they wouldn't even fall into that category so when ian says like education institutions, we can go even steps further and look at religion adjacent organizations that are furthering specific aims that stem from religion and that number and, gets even bigger and just things that we're not counting um there's uh, charities don't have to report or pay capital gains. So religious charities had over $47 billion in assets in 2018. Some of that is going to be invested. Some of that is going to be sold at some point. Some of that is going to be sold at a profit at $47 billion. We're pro probably talking about several billion dollars in capital gains every year, all of which is tax-free. If you had a few billion dollars in capital gains, You'd have a substantial tax bill, but it not if you are a religious charity. Well, I want so, to get a step further on what Leslie's saying here, because here in Saanich and, and across other places in British Columbia, when it looks at, you look at permissive tax exemptions, one thing you have to realize is when they, let's say a, a place of worship sells off their property to a developer to build housing. We want housing. We're in a housing crisis. I can't speak to the rest of the country. I'm pretty sure you're in a housing crisis too. And so this property is being sold off and the, the place of worship, the religious institution is pocketing several million dollars. The local government has been subsidizing that property for 
decades in free tax exemptions. Now, it, it gets really complicated because we want to encourage housing to be built. But at the same time, here's someone who has literally been developing massive capital gains, and even more so because they haven't been paying taxes on it. So there's multiple levels. I just wanted to yes and you on that one, Leslie, because it's there is, however, this is an area where there's policy work that can be done, which is when a property is sold, when an institutional property is sold that has received tax exempt status in the past, you can talk to your local government about recovering some of that tax revenue. Not all of it, because that would be, you know, <laughs> the whole thing we liquidated probably to cover 50 years of free taxes. But you can work on a formula that allows the local government to recover some money. And I see some potential here because local governments want money and they're desperate for money. Um, and so it's, it, there is an avenue there to get some to make some progress. Ian, I cut you off. I'm sorry. You wanted to add something. No, it's OK. I was just thinking more about, uh, you know, school funding here in B.C. We don't fund Catholic schools fully in the same way, but we do fund private schools at 50% of the amount we fund public schools. And when we counted up all of the 370 private schools in BC, 70% of them are religious, and they get about three three $350 million, probably they're getting about $500 million for all private schools this year. Uh, and most of those are religious. And the ones that aren't are generally targeted at the wealthiest students, there's only a small number that kind of cater towards people with high needs that are often trotted out as the defense of this system. Alberta has a similar system that gives $255 million to private schools. Uh, and Saskatchewan also gives $11 million to private schools. I didn't get the numbers for Manitoba. Uh, and hospitals also, we have uh, Catholic and religious run hospitals here in oh, BC, yes. they get a billion dollars. Uh, Alberta gets about $800 million, at least I know Ontario has these. And again, this is another situation where if we cut funding, we're not going to close St. Paul's Hospital in downtown Vancouver. We're going to have to transfer that to Vancouver Coastal Health. But that would mean then people's choices respected in those facilities, their choice of uh, reproductive health care, their choice of end of life health care, things that are not respected right now. And we just saw in Quebec a court case where Quebec has said all hospices, all palliative care facilities in Quebec, government funded or not, have to provide medical assistance in dying as an option to patients on site. Uh, a Catholic hospice fought it and lost with the judge saying there's a public interest in the patient's rights trumping the infringement on the organizational religious freedom here. So, yeah, uh, and Ian, I, I had a diatribe about Catholic hospitals because they are subject to the Catholic Health Ethics Guide um, uh, and it's just, I actually read it. Uh, and so I'm just going to put that in the chat. Uh, and if anyone that's interested can listen to, uh, about a 10 minute rant on the contents of the health ethics guide, but uh, Ian Teal, you said, what do we do? And I want to, I yes. want to move our conversation to that because I think yeah. that that is important. And, yeah. Uh, basically, what I would like to do is to see the government change three regulations. And these are tax code regulations. It's not even law. This is something that can be done administratively. And one is to remove advancement of religion as, uh, as, a, as a charitable purpose. If all you do is proselytize, if all you do is advance religion, you're not a charity. Now, now we should be able to, as part of this, as a practical matter allow charities that may have uh, once upon a time advanced religion and don't anymore. One good example is that the YMCA of Toronto is a charity and I think it deserves it. It does some wonderful things, but YMCA stands for Young Men's, Young Men's Christian Association. And once upon it, and when it initially became a charity, it, it declared it's to advance religion. We'll make it a very easy for them to say other charitable aspects. If your charity, was founded as advancement of religion will make it easy for you to do something else that or to declare as something else if in fact you do something else we'll also make it fairly straightforward to transfer it as a charity to a nonprofit because if you are um, a charity if you are an organization that it wants to just advance religion you should exist i'm not interested in shutting that down that would be terrible that's religious suppression and i'm against that very much so so we remove we remove advancement of religion as a as a as a charitable purpose. We make it easy for all of those existing charities to transfer to either a nonprofit status or to another charitable purpose that is actually charitable, and we move on. That's going to be four billion dollars or so uh, um, uh, of benefit to Canadians. And then we make two other changes. We simply remove the clergy residence exemption from the tax code. 
That's that like for, as a practical matter, that's very easy to do. If you're a professor and you're being moved from university to university and you get you get housing, well, that housing is added to your income and it's a taxable benefit. And that's fine. I think it should be. And if you're clergy and you're being moved from parish to parish and you get housing provided, that's fine. But that has value and it should be taxed as such. And so we simply remove that. It's an administrative act. And then we do the same for the property tax exemption. Again, that's just something written into the tax code. As a practical matter, it would be very easy to uh, uh, um, it would be very easy to take it out. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we're holding seminars like this. CFIC uh, uh, published a series of reports, and I will put the link in the in the notes if you want to dive deep into how we got the numbers. Uh, I'll put the link in the notes when I'm finished this little monologue. Um, we need to raise awareness. That's why we're having this conversation. Then we need to bring this to government. Talk to your local representative. If you are based in Ottawa or know someone it is, make an appointment and speak to the relevant people in a Canada Revenue Agency and say, we're running record deficits. Here's money that shouldn't be leaving your coffers that we can bring in. If we put the pressure on, we can make it uh, uh, clear that expending the political capital would be worthwhile and, and we can create the political will to make these relatively straightforward um, straightforward changes. And then we can use that momentum to build on the larger projects that CFIC, BCHA, and Humanist Canada are working on. Just today, in fact, uh, uh, CFIC, working with several other organizations, submitted a petition to the Ontario legislature to stop funding the Catholic school system in Ontario. Now, this is this petition is not going to bring about that goal, but it is going to raise awareness. And it is going to, we hope, start the ball rolling of raising awareness of just how much it costs Ontario. And that might be able to create that, but this is going to take a lot of effort. Similarly with Catholic healthcare, as Ian mentioned, um, we can do it one step at a time, but it requires our effort, our energy, and our activism to raise awareness, to generate outrage, and to make politicians aware that they are rather than lose votes by annoying or pissing off the uh, religious folks that are getting the benefit of these exemptions, that there is a much larger constituency that doesn't want tax dollars wasted in these ways. There are other things that, that can be done, but I'll pause there. Ian, Teal, Betty Ann, feel free to build on that. Yeah, I mean, let's get Eshmael's question in there. I know he's been had his hand yeah. up for a while. <clears throat> Thank you. Get yes, thank you. First of all, I really thanks for the report. It is absolutely wonderful, eye-opening. And my question was, you know, how we are going to, when we are talking about us, it is one thing. When you are talk, working about the legal system, the courts is another front. But then there is another front of 32% of BC population have not defined any religion in their census reports. My question is, how are we going to read or how are you going to read that critical aspect? I mean, I understand it is wonderful to work through the legality, through the courts, through the legislative system. That is absolutely wonderful and it is necessary. But my question is, what is the strategy to read those 32% of the BC population who do not report any faith, any religion in their census data. Ash that is the critical issue. And how are you going to do that? Thank you. Ashmail, it's 52% in British oh. Columbia. <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> it's 32% nationally, I think, but that doesn't yeah, answer your question. Right. That's thank just you. a pedant, uh, a flex. What we've tried to show, and this builds off of what I wanted to follow up with Leslie, is we focused a lot on municipal prayers here in British Columbia in our work at the BC Human Association. And we've done some work at the BC legislature on this as well. And I have been asked, you know, why are you focused on this largely symbolic issue that doesn't like make the big difference that some of these big numbers that Leslie talked about? And the answer is because we can win them really quickly and we can start to rack up wins and headlines. And these help build our momentum. So, you know, 
we can write, we wrote a threatening letter to the village of Belcara, population 800, and within 48 hours, they held an emergency council meeting in camera, got legal advice, and wrote, passed a motion that they would never do a prayer again. Uh, other councils weren't so responsive because that was impressive even to us that they went <laughs> that far, but that kind of victory is something that's harder to get on all of these other issues that have so much inertia. And what we need is exactly what you talked about, Eshmael, is getting the 52% who are non-religious, as well as a big chunk of the 48% who are religious but are pro-secular on our side on these issues and to be speaking out. Because one of the challenges we face on every single issue we hear is we're facing an organized and vocal, small, uh, organized group. Uh, if you're trying to take someone's benefit away, their privilege away, they are going to get mad about it, especially when they have churches to gather and complain about and networks and well-funded lobbying networks to fight back against. So we're chipping at the small, easy things while also doing the research on some of the bigger things on some of these larger issues. And so we get your emails when you sign, send emails to your local politicians using the tools on our website. And that helps, helps us build the network. So instead of being a couple hundred people, we're a couple thousand people next this year, we'll be 10,000 people next year, we'll be 100,000, 200,000 in a few years. And then we have the mass and we can mobilize people. But it does take patience and it does take continuing to write emails to your politicians, get those meetings, banging your head against the wall, even though it seems like they don't want to move every single time, even if you click a form letter, it's not going to change it, but it is going to get counted by some assistant who will go, hey, there were 400 people who cared about this issue yesterday and there weren't three days ago. What's going on? And they start to pay attention when those numbers add up. So it's not quick uh, and we're getting there is all I can say right now. I, I wanted to build on what Ian was saying because I have a lot more, I now have direct experience on the other side as being the politician who receives those emails. And I mean, sometimes as many as 20 or 30 emails is enough, especially in a small jurisdiction to trigger like a massive review. I sit on the board of our local library um, and if we get one letter from the public complaining about something, say, like that's that's on our board agenda <laughs> because we don't get a lot of correspondence. Whereas, you know, obviously the prime minister gets a lot of letters. But the thing I want to build on what Ian was saying very briefly was the first was organizational disparity, which he's done a really good job explaining. You have organized religious groups that meet on a weekly basis. They can mobilize their members. So when I try to pitch a bylaw amendment to remove permissive tax exemptions from our bylaws, they show up to the meetings and the general public is sort of a shrug emoji. Like, well, it doesn't really, eh, you know, it's like too percent of my taxes, whatever, whereas you have a group that's dedicated. So what Ian's talking about is that base organization. So we're able to mobilize people and actually counteract that. But the other, the other thing is jurisdictional arbitrage. One of the things I find is we have a lot of situations where some jurisdictions are more amenable to these kinds of changes than others. And in those situations, that's where we work. And so what Ian was describing with our municipal prayer approach was we basically had every single municipality in the province identified a set number that had problems and then approached them all. And we were able to whittle it down to two municipalities that are digging in their heels. And we, in the process, found some municipalities that were really open to making change and, and receptive to the message we were sending. Um, and one of the challenges I noticed as activists is sometimes some municipalities just, they're not on board. And you could spend your entire life trying to convince that current government, or you could move to the next jurisdiction and they're totally on board, they're two thumbs up and they're ready to pass it and the mayor's on board and he's writing the policy for you. So it, sometimes there's, it's as provincial and national and regional organizations, we can kind of just pick and choose where we operate. But the final thing I wanted to say is breaking these things down to small steps. Ian talked about this really well, which is you have these huge issues. And I find if you break them down to small chunks, A, it makes them more understandable and more like comprehensible to the general public, but you can also get wins. So for example, when it comes to permissive tax exemptions specifically, one of the things that we've advocated for is a benefits test. And you can go and talk to your city councillors any day and be like, hey, do we give out a tax exempt, do we give out tax status to uh, tax exemptions to places of worship? Yes. Do we have any checks and balances on that? And even the most conservative politician is going to be like, wait a minute, we just gave out $2.5 million without an application form. Like I've applied for grants for considerably less money. The application for a $300 grant in my city is six pages. Whereas to get a $120,000 tax exempt status, all you need to do is show that you're a church and you're good, right? That seems problematic. And so if you, you can talk to your city councilors about a benefits test. The other one that Ian and I talked about recently with our permissive tax exemption is, hey, what percentage of our taxes are permissive tax exemptions? 
And if it's more than 2%, could we not put a cap on that? So everyone still gets the same tax exemption, but it's shared equally. And we're not going to, it's not going to become a, too big of a percentage of our local municipal budget. And then the other ones would be uh, some of these broader conversations about abolishing, and this is kind of what Leslie was saying, abolishing the automatic tax exempt status, the assumption that a group does, the presumption that a group does good because they're a religious group or because spreading religion is seen as a good in and of itself, getting rid of statutory tax exemption and transferring into permissive tax exemptions, which gives municipalities the ability to decide, hey, you know what, actually, this group is doing good. As Leslie was pointing out, this local group provides educational and physical activity opportunities for young people. And that's great. We don't have those in our municipality. We wouldn't have them if they didn't provide them. So two thumbs up. Or hey, this insular religious group only rents its facility to its own members and refuses to let people in the door, let alone uh, engage in the community. Maybe we don't give them a tax exemption that's been, that's designed to support groups that provide a benefit to the community, just saying kind of thing. Yeah. But the critical thing is I think taking these big, almost insurmountable issues and breaking them down to small bite-sized chunks. I find that A, and what Ian was saying is very true. It lets you build momentum. It builds you, it allows you to build momentum and it allows you to accrete uh, growth and to cre make, create, uh, to build a foundation of little victories that you can then make larger victories uh, upon. And sometimes the sort of more symbolic acts allow you to then use that as a springboard into bigger, more substantial change. But it is really challenging when you have organized groups that are organized um, and we're just trying to be like, hey, let's be reasonable with our tax policy. It's difficult because you have differences of opinion when it comes to like preference. And every one of those victories is another news story for us, is another, especially in small town new papers where they uh, are desperate for content and will publish any news release you send them because they don't have many journalists left, unfortunately. But it means we can get a lot more news out there every time we go after one of these cities or, you know, earn these victories. And that helps put the issue out there, gets more people thinking about it. And so if you're thinking about prayer in your municipality, you're thinking about secularism, then we can start to talk to you about money. And we're, it's a slow building process, but it's, it can be frustratingly slow. I bet we've all been at this for a long time, I know. And so, I'm just going, one, one, one last thing. Okay. What you can do, get involved. Join BCHA, join Humanist Canada, join the Center for Inquiry Canada, if you can, donate to your favorite one of these organizations or even better all three volunteer what whatever it is that you can do do it offer oh. your time your energy your connections your expertise your organizational skills whatever it is that you have to offer offer it with us in concert together tell your friends tell your community don't just make this a humanist issue let's make it a canadian issue and we do it one person at a time two people at a time. Tell your friends, let them know that, hey, there's five and a half billion dollars just sitting there. Imagine what we can do with that. And there is so much that can be done with that, which we alluded to at the start of this talk. Very simply, we could reduce the debt or the deficit every year by five and a half billion dollars. We can fund all kinds of incredible programs. That would be more than enough to fund, for example, a basic income program across Canada. And there's so many other things that can be done, education, healthcare, whatever it is that is important to you. Well, here's a way that we can actually do it. So, but what, so there's very practical steps that we can take. We've talked about that. But the most important thing is that you join, support and volunteer people like Ian people like Martin and Betty Ann, people like Teal. And if you still have time left over, okay, fine, people like me at the Center for Inquiry Canada. But that's what you can do. And it is going to be together that we do make a difference. It doesn't matter how much effort Ian and Teal and Martin and Betty Ann put, for, put forth. We need your help. We need your support because if it's just a few individuals making these arguments, we're easily ignored. But if it's all of us together in a concerted effort, making a demand that Canada be a secular nation, Canada be a country that does not favor one faith over another or belief in general over non-belief, it's going to be because we demand it. Because institutional inertia is very difficult to overcome, but it can be done. We have already repealed Canada's blasphemy law. We have won two major cases at the Supreme Court of Canada. 
we <laughs> we are winning the demographic battle. Every generation is far more secular than the one before. And that's not automatic, and these can be reversed. But if we keep up the efforts, we will persevere, and we can overcome the disadvantages that we face. So please help us out, and thank you. I wanted to build on Leslie's comments, so I didn't properly introduce myself, friends. I'm the research coordinator for the BC Humanists, and we have a research team of volunteers. And a lot of the work that you saw that we put links to in the chat um, is research that's been done by our volunteer team. And so we'll actually have volunteers that will, you might, your job might just be hunting down annual reports for municipalities and reading them. It might be helping us find information through government websites, through uh, archives. It might be writing reports. It might be doing interviews, all sorts of different things. And uh, so we have a research team that's well, actually spread across the country. But a lot of times the work is whatever you need to do. Right now we're looking for people to help us transcribe prayers from Ontario Municipal Council meetings and to dive through and wade into uh, school district policies relating to dress codes, religion, and uh, LGBTQ plus issues. So if you're interested, get in touch. Uh, our research team is, it's sort of drop in when you can, and based on your skill level experience and interest in, in doing different things. So one of the Oops. things you can do is share this video. Um, and so we're going to end the recording. I'm going to um, ask Martin Frith to speak to us. But first, all of our speakers have agreed to stay on. They're going to take this pause to look at your questions. They're going to stay on. But Martin will end the video with our poll. But please share the video. It will be available on all of our platforms. Martin? Okay. Well, let me pop up the final poll and the... Uh... And then we can speak to the uh, the results of the first poll. This is really a test of uh, how well you've been listening. And is there any comment from our speakers on uh, on those three items? All right. So the it's uh, only about a third of people caught that it's the provincial government that uh, provincial governments rather that uh, transfer the most money to the uh, to religious charities. But uh, over three quarters, uh, no, we're paying attention and know that the public service rebate is a partial refund of HST or GST given by registered charities. I don't know about any of you, but before I did this research, I had never even heard of a public service body re rebate. And uh, yeah, over 90% of people caught that uh, houses of worship are, are exempt from municipal property taxes. So, well done. Okay. And the clergy tax exemption. Yeah, that one's just 100 million a year. People uh, mm -hmm. went a little higher on their guesses there, but, but I can see I why. Is, this one's interesting. I think it might, the reason why I find this one quite fascinating is it's more insidious in so far as you really fewer people have heard of this one. I mean, a lot of people know that churches and places of worship will be tax exempt, but this was one that really got me scratching my head because I thought, surely not. And there's a bunch of other ones. One thing we had our research team do a couple summers ago was compile a list of special religious exemptions in all Canadian law. And the list is, it varies from sumptuary regulations as it relates to clothing choices, to tax exempt status for residencies, to a whole bunch of other really interesting aspects. So the amount of research we have, at least there's a long list of work to do <laughs> and fun topics to dive into. There we go. Absolutely. So listen, as a final wrap up to all of this, I want to thank our uh, our panelists for putting together just such an amazing wealth of information. Uh, I think if you go to sleep tonight angry, that's probably a good thing. But wake up tomorrow uh, being glad you're a humanist and facing the world. Um, so thank you, Leslie Rosenbud, for all the uh, research that CFI has done. Uh, Ian Bushfield and Teal Phelps for Bondaroff for all of the uh, great research. And, uh, and for Betty Ann Hedges from Humanist Canada for, uh, for hosting tonight's event. Uh, what the great rate takeaway for me is the importance of knowledge and research. Um, what you've provided us is a wealth of resources and rather than getting uh, burdened by the numbers, it certainly is a reminder that data makes a difference uh, in moving forward. And I think that uh, to reasonable people and rational people, data makes a difference. So this is such an incredible and important beginning uh, to the work that um, uh, the Secular Connection has done, Doug Thomas, uh, you know, in this area. There are so many people who are doing remarkable work. 
and uh, and but uh, and that's the great reminder that we can't do this alone, but uh, together. And hence, the bringing together of uh, important organizations tonight is a reminder that uh, we are looking at this with a focused vision and look forward to ongoing collaboration. So with that being said, uh, uh, thank you to our speakers. And uh, as Betty Ann has mentioned, uh, they'll stay on to do some follow up. Uh, but this ends the formal presentation uh, for the evening. Mm -hmm.